Welcome to STEM Lab, where we discuss preparing students for success in a rapidly changing world. And here's your host, Michael Newsom. Happy to have you here with us today on STEM Lab. Today I'm with my co-host, Dr. Nicole Kreger. Nicole, how are you doing today? I'm doing good, Michael. I think we're at the, the end of the semester where all educators are maybe feeling both a little overwhelmed and excited and uh, just like our students are. So that's, that's how I'm doing as the semester wraps up. Nicole, you and I just got back from Phoenix at the National Consortium of Secondary STEM Schools Annual Professional Conference. Really enjoyed that. We went there with a whole team from the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. How did you feel about the conference? Oh, I think it's always great to interact with other schools and especially with schools that are doing things very similar to how, what we're doing. So it's, it's always a little bit invigorating to hear what they're doing, see how schools are doing things similar to what we're doing, and then also get some good new ideas to bring back to the classroom and start thinking about as we move into the spring semester. Yes, I know that you're very dedicated to doing well in the classroom and you like to take those things back with you from conferences, which uh, brings up this podcast that we're working on. Can you tell me why you like being involved in it? What do you hope to accomplish? I enjoy having these conversations. It's it's like professional development for me getting to talk to various people. And uh, it gives me an excuse to reach out to people and say, hey, you want to talk to me about engineering? Uh, I'm a mathematician, but I want to hear what you do in your class. And so um, I really enjoy just getting to talk to, to the people and, and hear what they're doing and see how it can inform my classes. Yes, I've learned a lot from doing STEM Lab, too. It's really helped me hone in those things that I think are important to me. Who did you bring to talk to us today? Uh, I have Dr. Josh Gargak. He was uh, a peer of mine at the University of Notre Dame, where we were both getting our graduate degrees. He, he got his PhD in bioengineering, and then from there, he spent six years at the University of Mount Union before he took a job at Ohio Northern University, which is actually where he got his undergraduate degree as well. Well, let's see what Dr. Josh Gargak had to say. Hi, Josh. Welcome to STEM Lab. Thanks for joining us today. Hi. So, Josh, you are an engineering professor. Can you talk about your approach to pedagogy with respect to engineering? One of the big kind of focuses of my institution is uh, in developing entrepreneurial mindsets. So we are a part of a network called the Kern Entrepreneurial Engineering Network. So this is Keen, so K-E-E-N. Uh, so Keen was founded in 2005, uh, and it was basically a network of schools. We started, uh, I think, around 30, maybe 25 schools. Ohio Northern was one of like the first members, uh, but now we're up to over 55 schools. And these are all engineering institutions. Uh, and they range small schools like Ohio Northern to large schools like Ohio State. Uh, and the goal is to reach all undergraduate students with entrepreneurial mindset so that they can create uh, personal, economic, and societal value through a lifetime of meaningful work. A lot of people, when you say entrepreneurial mindset, they're not sure what that means. And they think, okay, entrepreneurship, starting a business, I don't want to start a business, so not for me. Okay. Uh, but that's not really what we mean when we say entrepreneurial mindset. Kind of to frame this, we can think about what is a key to success for a student or a person. So one thing you could look at is, oh, the technical skills that I get in through a STEM education, right? That will lead to my success. And that that's certainly important and it's one part of it. But as kind of Keen would explain it is that they would say, it's more than just your technical skills. It's how you think, right? So researchers would call that like metacognition, right? Or what's your, your basically your mindset going into things. Or your, so what are your attitudes and dispositions associated uh, with how you think uh, about the world around you? Uh, and then that determines how you apply your skill set. Uh, so the example that I've heard uh, people from Keen use is that you can have a surgeon, right, or a doctor, and they can have a set of skills, right? So they can know how to create incisions and locate um, different anatomical uh, features in the body. And they can, they can know how to like suture and close their incision. Um, and that's all good. And they can be a good doctor. But what makes them a great doctor is if, if they combine that with a mindset focused on caring for their fellow man, right? So that's... Right. So that's the distinguishing between a great doctor and just 
a doctor that can be good at what they do. Right? So mindset provides direction, right? To what you're going to do. Uh, so when it comes to mindsets, one in particular is responsible for much of human progress, right? So thousands of new industries, billions of jobs, lifting myriads of people out of poverty. And we would say that that's the entrepreneurial mindset, right? So the mindset associated with entrepreneurs, right? And this, once again, this is not about or just about value creation. And, and when we teach it to students, we don't talk about value creation at all. Like you would if you were teaching entrepreneurship, right? Um, here, we're, we're th you know, entrepreneurial mindset can apply to any company, nonprofit, government agency, university. It's just kind of the uh, thinking like an entrepreneur, entrepreneur does. And we found that when you couple this with a engineering or really a STEM skill set, right? Because, you know, people with STEM skill sets can solve a lot of Right, are equipped to solve a lot of the world's problems, right? Then, then we create students that are agents for change, right? Ready to kind of define society uh, of tomorrow. Right. Oh, that's really interesting, Josh. Yeah. So that's like in my calculus class, I focus a lot on the skills. You can compute an integral. You can do a derivative, but you're you're adding an extra mindset on top of that. That's neat. So what is, what does that look like in your classes? How do you combine that with the skills that you're teaching students? Sure. Well, first we need to define entrepreneurial mindset a little bit farther, right? So Keen did a bunch of work with their member institutions to come up with a definition and they came up with a very simple one uh, and they called it the three C's. Uh, so the first one is curiosity. The second one is connections. And the third one is creating value. Okay. So curiosity, um, basically we can break that into uh, demonstrating constant curiosity about kind of uh, the changing world around us, right? So, um, and this doesn't, right, notice in your class, this doesn't have to be just curiosity for exactly what you're doing in class. It can be curiosity about anything, right? Because uh, then when you get to the second part, it's connections, right? So you can have something completely unrelated, uh, but if you can connect it then to something that you're doing, then you have the opportunity to create value, right? So one example that I like to use uh, is that uh, I uh, like video games, right? So I have, um, so I got a uh, Nintendo Switch uh, and I uh, enjoyed it. And then I, on my research side, I am kind of in the biomedical engineering sphere, but I was always interested in like kind of rehabilitation and motion-based things. So um, the Nintendo Switch is kind of like the Nintendo Wii and it has like, uh, I grab a controller here. It has, uh, it has accelerometers and gyroscopes in the controller so you can do motion-based kind of games associated with it. So when I was playing my Switch, I was like, ah, I wonder if there is a way to actually use this in like a rehab setting, right? So then I ended up starting like this completely different research field, right? Potentially uh, for me, right? Project um, based on kind of something that wasn't even related to what I was doing at work. So kind of the example of being interested in something, making a connection with something else, and then going into value. All right, so... A part of creating value. Uh, so each of these, um, Keen kind of breaks each of those three C's into like two kind of points, right? So uh, curiosity was constant curiosity. And then the second one was exploring a contrarian view of accepted solutions, right? So kind of thinking differently. Uh, for connection, it was integrating information from many sources to gain insight. And then the other one is accessing and managing risk. So they often talk about engineers as being risk tolerant. Um, and then uh, creating value, right? So identify unexpected opportunities to create value. So that was the example I gave you. The other one is persisting through and learning from failure. And this is, this is where I kind of do a lot of my ped pedagogical work, uh, which it has to cut dealing with this learning from learning from failure. So um, 
I find that students more and more are, are not very failure tolerant. Yes, exactly. I agree. <laughs> and right. So we have this push to kind of instill entrepreneurial mindset. Uh, but one of the reasons I think students are not failure tolerant is because they have they have figured out the system, like the education system. Right. And they know, right, that they don't they don't necessarily get good grades for trying different things. They get 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 the right grade for getting the correct answer. Yes. On problems. So if it's not the correct one single answer, then it is not worth anything, right? Oh, uh -huh. So we often see like right more grade focused people than people that are actually interested in in learning and understanding the material. Um, so in engineering. This becomes a problem because we have two different types of problems, and it's not just engineering. I'm sure you have this in other STEM fields too, is that you have right your convergent problems, which all the information you have converges to the single solution. But then you have divergent problems, which is like there could be multiple answers, and each of them are right in different ways, right? So we would like an engineering design problem, right? Design a solution to a certain problem. There could be multiple different ways of solving. So a lot of times students will have trouble dealing with the ambiguity associated with problems that don't have a one specific right answer, right? So one way you solve that is you give them more ambiguity, right? And have them, and have them deal with right things that could have multiple answers. And then they have to, you know, use reasoning skills uh, and other skills associated with problem solving methods or the engineering design process to right kind of kind of solve those and explain why their solution works better than other potential solutions right right so that's one way that's typically seen that doesn't solve the problem of for a convergent problem like feeling the stress of getting that same answer right that right answer um so I, I like anecdotally, and I'm sure there's research probably somewhere to back this up, but I feel like how a typical course is organized where you have, right, here's my lecture and then here's some homework and then here's my high stakes exam and you got to do well on the exam or because it's worth like 30% of your grade or 20%. Um, I feel like that puts a lot of pressure on students to succeed on um, and it does not give them the opportunity to learn from their mistakes and demonstrate that they can learn from their failures. Right. Exactly. Yeah. We're not like our typical education system is not modeling the fact that failure is okay and good. So, okay. So how do you get around that? So, so one tool that I've been using, and I did not invent this, uh, and I didn't even, right. And I learned from other people, uh, uh, is called mastery-based learning. Um, or another word for it would be like competency-based assessment. Um, so the idea in a mastery-based learning or competency-based assessment is that you have a set of skills that you that the students must pass throughout the semester. Uh, but uh, if they don't pass the skill the first time, they can take it again and they can keep retaking it. It's not usually the same question. Right, so they usually get a different question, uh, but it's measuring the same, the same skill, uh, and they can take it multiple times, uh, to then and then learn from the times that they didn't get it right to eventually prove that they they solved it. So, uh, I teach a class on machine kinematics and dynamics, which so it's basically like how do machines move, how do forces translate through them. Um, so one of the very first, and this is to junior students. Um, and so how I have my class set up is I have five, we have 11 total skills that they can test on throughout the semester. Five of them they have to pass in order to pass the class. Okay. And then they can, and we have 10 different testing days across the semester. So they have 10 opportunities to get five problems completely right, essentially. And so. So there's a lot of people that we have in our program that have skated by on like partial credit. Like they haven't gotten a single kind of exam problem right their whole career, but because that they showed that they 
they had something that looked close to maybe what it was, they got some partial credit. So competency-based assessment doesn't work like that. You have to show that you understand it. But you, right, because you have multiple times to show it, you can take your attempt, go on, get feedback, try again, and keep. So before I moved to competency-based assessment, I would not see students during office hours like at all. At all. They, even students that I knew had no idea what was going on would not show up. Like I, I couldn't do, the only people I would come would, would be people that already were getting A's and then they had, they had a question. So, so as soon as I started competency-based assessment, you know, the first couple exams, you don't see any students, but then after they've failed to pass some of these skills two, three, four, five times, all of a sudden you have a line outside your office. And so I've been coming in in the evenings before the exam dates uh, at like 8 a.m. or at 8 p.m. And I've been here until like 1030, just running through a constant stream of students. Because uh, I think like also they students tend not to always know what they don't know. And if you keep just like, OK, that's I guess you kind of have an idea. Now on to the next topic. Let's in. And so um, I think a lot of students just. Right, they've been they've been moved along, so they'll keep they'll keep moving along, uh, and they'll always know just about I don't know sixty percent of how to do everything, right? So, so it's kind of rethinking this idea instead of like passing because you know sixty percent of everything, you you would pass because you know sixty percent of the total you can do sixty percent of it perfectly, right? You just, that's great, yeah, because then you're making sure the, the students actually know what they really do and don't know, and you're giving them multiple attempts to make sure that they can figure it out before the end of the semester. What have your students thought about the the mastery-based grading? So I think most of them like it. So there are several times in the semester that they they have tests in other classes. So because they have the flexibility, because there's a test every week, um, a lot of them have been like, okay, I'm going to prioritize these other tests. Uh, so they, 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 rather than the tests in my class, which makes it easy for me to grade that week, but that's neither here nor there. Like they, uh, they do enjoy, I think, that flexibility. There are some students, um, the biggest complaint I think I have is that I couple it with a flipped classroom. Uh, so it requires students to watch the lectures ahead of class. And then the they are required to like upload their notes to prove that they watched the lecture. And then in class, we work on the homework assignments. Um, so also, right, because the homework assignments are the harder part, so they need more help with that. Trying to like, right, organize the whole class to kind of address this. It's okay if we do things wrong, right? That's part of the process. I don't expect for you to do this right the first time. So even with the homework, you come to class, you give it a try, and then you look at my solution, you update how you do it. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I flipped my calculus classes as well. And I love I love this idea of like you're really mixing in a lot of different ways to prepare students for the future, right? Like in their future jobs, if they need to learn something, they're not going to have a built-in teacher there to teach them. But so they're going to have to do some research on their own and then maybe rely on their coworkers. And then also just kind of being getting comfortable with, with failure along the way. In a class I have on computer-aided design, um, I, I just had students finish a project in which they they researched. It's called um, geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. It's a very uh, kind of kind of advanced way of uh, dimensioning and uh, calling out tolerances on drawings that would go out to a manufacturer. Uh, and instead of teaching them, I actually assigned them each an element from it, and they researched it on their own including looking up the standards governed by right our professional body. And then they created a video to teach each other and a note sheet for their uh, for uh, their classmates. Uh, and I just got done reviewing them yesterday and they were they were so good this year and it's like this is this is a very valuable skill right if you can go and synthesize all this information together, create something to teach other people, uh, and then, right, it's like those are the sorts of people that that can people that can do that are the ones that will be promoted, right? They're gonna 
right? They're gonna provide a lot of value, right? So when we talk about value for entrepreneur mindset, it's not just money, right? Right. There's a lot of different ways uh, that you can create value and you can define value a, a lot of different ways. That, um, and that's one way that, right, kind of trying to, to bring in kind of this, this mindset can create value. Yeah, that's cool. It sounds like you're doing so much in your classes, really, to prepare students for their future. It's not like, well, just build these skills as an engineer, but like, let's prepare you for the real world. Um, I want to circle back to this idea of curiosity, mainly because I'm curious. Um, I was at a conference recently and we were talking about the idea of curiosity and the the presenter uh, gave this quote or the statistics, which was really sad to me, was that kind of by the time students are in fifth grade, they're like, moments of curiosity have like totally dwindled to like less than one per week you know like toddlers are so curious what is this why is this how does this work but then by the time students had got into fifth grade those like periods of curiosity had dwindled so how do we bring that back into students because it's so important for for the future and for their job so do you have any ways in which you're really kind of building that those moments of curiosity for your students so i i think that students are naturally curious just most of the stuff that they interact with in the curriculum is not always going to be interesting to them. Uh, so one thing that I have found to be effective in one of my classes, so it's the same one with the competency-based assessment. Uh, we do a design project. And as when we start the project, uh, they don't actually know what their design project is, but I have them start with a photo journal. So they will go around campus and their daily life and just take pictures of things that they found interesting. Um, okay. Right. So, <laughs> so they don't even, they don't even know what the goal of the project they don't, is. They don't know what they're the, just goals, taking pictures. the goal is. They're, okay. just, they're, they're just taking pictures of things that they find uh, to be interesting. Now the project itself ends up being like an assistive device project um, that um, I've interviewed uh, people in the community and created like profiles, like client profiles for them to engage with. Um, so they need to create an assistive, the project is that they need to create an assisted device to um, help the person in their profile. Uh, but, right, they're, they are told that they are supposed to create value for that person. So the value that they decide to create could be anything that they want. They just have to explain why it is value. So some people, some of the students will address specifically what like some of the things that the client said. Like we have uh, one client who um, suffers from what's called foot drop when she walks and it. So like her foot doesn't kind of like lift up. So that can cause like, right, she could hit it on things and like stumble easily. Um, so a lot of the, a lot of people will design like a brace to try to like move move her, her foot up. Um, but other times, like some of the clients have left it a little bit more broad, so then they can connect back to what they're interested in. So I've got a lot of people interested in cars uh, for mechanical engineering. Um, and it's like, there are a lot of th things with a car that is difficult for a differently able person, right, to interact with. So there's all sorts of projects associated with that. Um, so, right, take a look at your photo journal right? Try to find the ideas that are good, right? And see if you can connect the things you're curious with, with a way to create value for your client. And then we, ca we captured the three C's. <laughs> that's also, yeah, and that's a fun way to connect curiosity and really get at the fact that what students are interested about in the real world can, can be connected back to the course material. It's not like, oh, you're interested in cars, but that does like connect to the, the to the other things that we're doing. Nice. Josh, as we uh, wrap up here, I, I, this is a question that I love asking people, but what motivates you as a teacher? So one of the reasons why I wanted to teach at a university rather than, um, right, do research is I like the human side of it, right? So I, I am teaching at the university that I went to. Um, so I'm an alum of Ohio Northern. And when I was here, um, kind of, I, I feel like a lot of my success now was because of the dedication of my faculty when I was a student, right? So when you go to an education focused university, right? The, the faculty are there for you, right? As a student. Uh, 
And I feel like kind of the dedication that I saw for my faculty and their interest in my life, right, motivated me to kind of like go on, get a PhD and, and, and come back uh, and teach. Um, so I suppose it's a way of, it's a way of, right, paying forward kind of what I received. Um, but, uh, you know, I, a lot of engineers end up working in industry um, and they get, they get paid more. Um, but um, I really, I really like the, the human kind of day-to-day -day interactions that I have uh, with the students and my colleagues and about the university. That's awesome. Yeah. And those engineers who are out in the industry need people like you who are helping prepare students for for those future jobs and make sure that they really have the, that skill set. That's awesome. Yeah. We also need people from industry reaching out to kind of help uh, kind of kind of tell us. And we, we do, we're very lucky that we do have a lot of um, alum and other engineers that give back. Um, so um, right. A lot of people are really interested in kind of like the development of kind of our next next generation of the workforce and you know these important skills that we can kind of prepare them uh, uh before they get hired yeah yeah and what a great point like education of future stem students can't happen in isolation within an educational um institution we need we need the people who are actually out doing things as well to come back and, and we, form we would quickly be obsolete without our <laughs> our industry counterparts right helping <laughs> but, us make sure that we're, we're best preparing students. Thank you for joining us today, Josh. Yeah, no, it's been it's been a blast. I'm happy uh, uh, to kind of share my experiences. I felt a real connection to a lot of the things that Dr. Joshua Gargak talked about in that interview. I teach a course called Tech Ventures. In that course, the students do design thinking, they have to do a pitch deck, and they have to communicate everything. And it is the mindset that they learn in a class like that. I recently asked my students to write an essay about what were the most important things that they've learned in this course, Tech Ventures. And they all said very similar things. One of those being the idea of failure and learning from failure and continuing forth. Another one was the idea that you're solving a problem. As an entrepreneur or someone trying to create something, you've got to keep it in the context of adding value by solving someone's problem. And another element, of course, is communication. The students learn that it's very important how you communicate things. So I think these classes in entrepreneurship are so valuable, and I'm very grateful that Dr. Gargak was able to come and talk about it. Well, the thing that stood out to me, Michael, was this idea of curiosity, because this is something that kind of has has popped up in a few of our other podcasts and came up at a conference that I was at recently. So just kind of allowing students, once again, like you said, that idea of failing um, and and how do we get that idea of curiosity back into our students' lives because they need it in STEM disciplines. They need to be curious and be thinking of creative solutions. Well, I'm looking forward to our next time together. And remember, until then, keep learning and growing. You have been listening to STEM Lab, produced in the studios of the South Carolina Governor's School for Science and Mathematics. 